Good evening, it's Dr. Soloway here, resuming with a fall lecture series. So uh, we're gonna get started shortly. Tyler? So on today's episode, we're gonna be talking about osteoporosis. And uh, the first question about osteoporosis that we typically get are, are there ways to keep osteoporosis from worsening? First question, and by the way, these questions were um, from my other videos, the, a lot of the questions that were the most commonly asked from you, the patients, the audience. So how do you prevent osteoporosis from progressing? So uh, the primary prevention of osteoporosis would mean how do you get your bone density um, as, as high as possible by age 35 when you stop building new bone? And that would be with keeping adequate calcium, vitamin D, and drinking milk. However, the question that really is being asked, um, and you have to read, the, read between the lines as the answer of the question, the question is really, what do the postmenopausal women do? What do the people on steroids do? What do the people that are alcoholics do? What do the people do that have high risk for loss of bone? So maintenance of calcium and vitamin D is very important. Weightness, I'm sorry, maintenance of weight-bearing exercise is very important. Uh, cessation of smoking, alcohol, and other um, bone detrimental or bone loss um, items, if you will, are going to be something that you need to know about. So if you want to lose weight, you don't eat cake. If you want to lose bone, you do this and that. If you want to build bone, you try to stay away from things that make you lose bone. So you stay away from alcohol, smoking, and um, anything else that's felt to be a risk factor, such as being a thin white female. Now, you can't control the fact that you were born as a thin white female, but you should certainly make sure you're on your calcium and vitamin D. And if your bone density and risk of fracture is high enough, you need to be treated. So the treatment for postmenopausal osteoporosis would typically be a bisphosphonate. The bisphosphonates come in oral and IV or, or uh, subcutaneous or intramuscular injections. The one I prefer um, for uh, bisphosphonate therapy would be Reclast or Zometa, which is um, zoledronic acid. Uh, the beauty of this drug is it's given once a year and it's going to force uh, compliance. So what happens, the drug blocks the osteoclast, which is the cell that um, resorbs bone. Um, to understand how osteoporosis works and how to fix it, you have to understand a little bit about bone biology or bone histology. So um, think of a uh, road with a pothole. Uh, the pothole was dug by the osteoclast. And to fix the pothole, you have to lay a seam or a subfloor called the osteoid seam, which is vitamin D. And then you pour tar and you close the pothole. And that's done by a cell called the osteoblast or the bone building cell. So the first treatment or the first line of treatment is to use an osteoclast inhibitor. So hence, uh, try not to dig a pothole, but you can't stop the pothole. So what you want to do is you want to uh, inhibit the amount of pothole that can be dug. So the amount of tar filling in the pothole and the pothole is really relating to your uh, or synonymous with your bone, I should say. So. Again, primary prevention, just to say, you wanna build up your bone by age 35 with exercise, calcium, and vitamin D. And um, after you pass 50 and you're losing bone, uh, to stop that and to reduce your risk of fracture, you go on a bisphosphonate. I prefer Reclass because it's injectable. I prefer injectable because there's better compliance and there's better absorption. And most people, frankly, can't tolerate alendronate or residronate. These drugs are very difficult to tolerate. And uh, ibandronate is a nitrogen-containing bisphosphonate, and the nitrogen-containing bisphosphonates have a higher risk of avascular necrosis of the jaw, albeit very low. So all the drugs have a risk of something, um, but it's important to know what the relative risk actually is. The um, others uh, who, let's say, um, qualify for something stronger than a bisphosphonate would uh, go to Prolia, which is uh, denuzumab. 
This is a monoclonal antibody that blocks an enzyme called rank ligand. Rank ligand controls the osteoclast. So it's a way to block the osteoclast without binding to the bone. So the bisphosphonates actually bind to the bone while the, um, the rank ligand inhibitor does not. So for that reason, uh, the rank ligand inhibitor can be continued forever while the uh, bisphosphonates need to be stopped from time to time for periods of time. And uh, frankly, the bisphosphonate is not as powerful or, or is not as potent, not as good at preserving or uh, thickening the existing bone as um, um, prolia. Prolia is a subcutaneous injection given twice a year must keep adequate calcium and vitamin D. In fact, if your calcium is too low, very, very grave danger zone for severe reactions. But this is a wonderful drug to build bone. So I just talked about, um, I, I use the word building bone. I want you to, I want to make one thing very, very clear in this video. We did not talk about anything to actually build bone. The two drugs I just mentioned about, um, the bisphosphonate and the rank ligand inhibitor, and this would apply technically, or at least in the lab, to any bisphosphonate. You're not building new bone, you're thickening and enhancing existing bone. We don't get into using bone builders until there's actually fractures already have occurred. Uh, there have already been fractures that have already occurred. The um, International Society for Clinical Densitometry which is one of the three organizations that has too much to say about uh, how doctors work and guidelines and so on. Um, they uh, frown upon the use of severe, mild, or moderate. However, the one place where there's an exception and it's, it, it is acceptable is that if a person has osteoporosis uh, by virtue of their bone density study, if they also have an osteoporotic fracture, they'd be considered severe. For somebody with severe osteoporosis, Rather than um, inhibiting their osteoclast, you'd be stimulating their osteoblast. And that would be teriparatide or forteo or uh, romosuzumab, which is uvinity. There are others, but those are the uh, common ones in my practice. Um, I hope this finds you well. I hope you don't break anything. And if you do, give me a call, right? Um, and by the way, a couple of things. I want to plug my book, Bad Medicine. It's been out since October of 2020. We've sold about 5,000 copies. I'm an unknown author, but it's a great book. Now, the audience that I have here, you 3,000 people that are subscribers, are generally from out of the United States, certainly not from uh, the local area. Um, more than thrilled and uh, honored that I have a following that's international and patients use people out there have um, put me on the map, literally globally, uh, 10, 20 countries worth of you, uh, people from many states, almost all the states have now come in. It's very hard for me to manage somebody when they come in for one visit. I can certainly give an opinion and it can't just do it virtually. Vir a virtual doctor is um, vir vir uh, like virtual sex. It's just not the same. Uh, don't ask me how I know. Okay, you need to know that. But uh, really, the virtual medicine is only for time of emergency. It shouldn't be uh, standard of care. Nobody should get used to it. Nobody should be comfortable with it. And frankly, as a paying consumer, you should run from virtual medicine. You should want real medicine where the doctor actually talks to you. I've been told, Doc, you're the only guy that ever examined my feet. Well, I don't know where the other guys were when they were in school, but you got to examine everything. So... Thank you again and have a great night.